everybody, and welcome to Naturalistics, a podcast dedicated to helping you become a better naturalist. My name is Stefan. Here with me is Matt. What's up? And today on Naturalistics, we're going to be discussing animal personalities and how that applies to your naturalist study and observations. Yeah, excited about this topic. It's uh, complex, but we've wanted to discuss it for quite some time. It's actually a pretty hot topic in the science world right now. (laughs) Stefan's cat is here, Hamish. He's got a uh, distinct personality himself, actually. He's full of personality. So how are you doing, Stefan? I'm doing pretty well. Yeah, we've been in the throes of some sloppy seacoast winter weather. Oh, yeah, some crappy crappy stuff. We we had a deep freeze, and then... Now we're dealing with the sort of weird, like, rainy, icy, rainy, yeah, not real, not real winter where I come from. Not real where I come from. Doing all right. (laughs) Yeah. Okay, wait, so I have something for you. So, recently, it's been discovered that off the coast of New Zealand, there were once colonies of giant penguins the size of humans. Six foot tall penguins, massive colonies of penguins. What do you think about that? I think I I would be suspicious, and and my first my my where my mind goes initially is that I suspect it's a hoax. I suspect it's just people in penguin suits. Oh come on! Well, see, I actually was thinking the same thing, but a little bit like more um like X Filesy. So where... aliens in penguin suits? No 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 like <laughs> like what if the penguins still live amongst us but they're wearing human suits <laughs> oh kind of like men in black but okay yeah like where all the aliens live amongst us yeah with human suits mm-hmm. but instead of that they're just penguins yeah penguins. Think it's viable viable theory i mean highly intelligent penguins if they're wearing human suits to blend in true true well, anyway, a lot of people were asking me about that, and I thought I'd bring that. A lot of people were asking you about that. They thought it was weird. <laughs> they were like, Matt, have you heard about this weird, these giant penguins? Yeah. So is it, um, what's the what's the vintage of the of this species? Was it, uh, how, how, how far back? Is, um, is it like in the fossil a record? A couple or? million years, but relatively recent geologically, right? I okay. mean, I think, you know. A couple mil. There was something also about them spearing their fish. They had, like, really long bills, proportionately. Oh, nice. And they speared their fish, which I think is... It's just hard for me to imagine that sometimes, like... Yeah, like, once you get it, how do you like open your what, bill? How does that work? I'm not sure... I'm not sure about that theory. Does, I, that, does any... Do any... Um, yeah, exactly. What, extant birds... Do, do any birds that we have around today use their bill as a spear? to catch prey so i was wondering the same thing and i'm not quite sure so if you're listening out there and you know the answer to this question get back to us because i want to know i'm not really sure as far as i know i would say no and i i think the biomechanics of it don't really make a lot of sense to me so unless you had sort of like the sort of like the uh the one-way barbs going back up the bill you you i could see that like you you spear your prey, and then they kind of get stuck. They can't slide okay. back off again. And then, and then you, you you fly back to your nest, whatever, to feed your young. I don't think they fly. And and then <laughs> and then you and then you wig, I'm just saying for birds in general. And then you wiggle it off, or you, right. or you well, pull it off with your with. Seems your, like a lot of work if feed. you would just catch it with your mouth, but. Yeah, but think about how aerodynamic that is. I guess You're you plunging get a much bigger down. Fish. All right, so that's enough about penguins. Let's talk about personalities. Do they exist? We don't really know. Do nope. they really exist? Nobody knows. <laughs> I think that naturalists fall along a spectrum on personality. Obviously, there's a lot of personalities amongst naturalists, but that's not what I'm talking about. <laughs> there's naturalists that literally ignore personality as something interesting and something to try and understand, something try to try and tinker with and think about. And then there are and I think that there's people, you know, a lot of listers and just like people who are very objective to the core or want to be objective to the core about their naturalist study, want to discount it as not real science or not real, real, <laughs> not really real. And then there's the other group, there's another extreme 
which might be people who only dwell in the world of personality and like feeling what animals under like think and like trying to understand animal emotion trying to understand the way that you know plants might deal with different situations based on what they how, how they are personally as individuals things like that mm. but i think both those extremes are incorrect and there's a middle ground there where we can study personality and not get sucked into something that's sort of like airy fairyland, but also not like lose out on like this amazing realm of natural history. And why animals do the things that we see them do. Exactly. Why are, why when you watch blue jays is one always, you know, sneaking around while one is always up on the top of the tree making tons of noise. Why in a coyote group is there one that, you know, takes a di different approach to finding its prey than all the other ones. Or with Hamish, a little cat here, he's got a very <laughs> distinct personality. He's not aloof. He loves to play. He loves to be around people. You know, most cats aren't like that. A lot of cats are just chilling in the corner, you know, minding their <laughs> own business all the time. He's the opposite of that. So, and amongst people too, right? I mean, that's fair, fair to say that people are very different and personalities exist. So, mm-hmm. You know, when we look out on the animal world, same thing applies. And But there's some hazards to that. There's some dangers to thinking that animals are just like people. So we're going to get into that today. And we wanted to just start off with just a, a, the acknowledgement that personalities are real. And they it's something that you can, you as a naturalist, can understand and, or um, work on an understanding of. So it's, it occurs to me, Matt, that maybe a little bit of back, background on this about the, the history of animal personality and its acceptance or lack thereof in the scientific community over over the course of, um, you know, the past. Yeah, I think that's... So, 100 years or so. So Stefan and I uh, just read this book called Mousy Cats and Sheepish Coyotes by John A. Shivik. It was pretty good, but it, it it's kind of an overview of personality in the past... Um, 100 years in the science world. So, and it talks a lot about why the study of personality in the science world is only just coming about as a as being acknowledged, sort of. And a lot of that comes from this obsession with objectivity in biology, right? So, I think there, there's, uh, there is, in biology, there is a certain level of feeling like biolog biologists feeling that they have to prove that they are a legitimate science. Yeah, I think that, yeah. And Kaya, and, Kaya talked about that on, on when she came on. Right, yeah, and she mentioned the physics envy thing, because in in some scientific disciplines there are, there's like absolute right. truth in, in so many, you know, in, in basically in, in, in the entirety of the, Correct. Yeah, like <laughs> of math. the field. Like, and, and using math to prove things constantly. And and so it's very satisfying to be able to to say like this is absolutely, you know, yeah. this way for sure every time no matter what. Yeah. done. And in biology, as many of us, you know, as naturalists and and as biologists and people, you know, people who study uh animals and plants and biological life, you know that that is hard to find in nature. It's hard to find absolute you know, things things that will happen this way, absolutely certain every time, no matter yeah. what. And and so there, there, so you get this physics envy, which is like people studying biology wanting to legitimize their field of study by making it as close as possible to that that physics certain to being able usually. to have that kind of certainty. Exactly, like. If X happens, then Y happens. And there's your trophic cascade. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. Like, and that trophic it's, cascade it's nice is a great example of it in ecology. Yeah, it's nice but, to have But this. that's where some of these real phenomena cannot be proven by math, but they exist. And that doesn't mean that we can't study them. So personality is a great example of this, where we can't quantify. It's very, very difficult to quantify personality and therefore very hard to study in an objective sense, but it doesn't mean we shouldn't study it. It doesn't mean that we can't 
glean really cool, interesting information from understanding this stuff. Yeah, I think I think there's to to put it bluntly, it's like things things that aren't neat and tidy. Yeah. are ignored because because you don't want to deal with the untidiness yeah. of them. And and so it's like we'll just ignore we'll just focus on the tidy stuff. Right. And then we'll ignore the untidy stuff and animal personality, personalities in and emotions in animals is extremely untidy. Yeah. And so, oh, yeah. And so, there's, so is ecology. So as yeah. far, in, in terms of the, his, the history aspect of, of this is that because of that untidiness, it's been sort yeah. of pushed aside, ignored, denied completely yeah. for a long time. And only just recently as, as uh, was, you know, sort of the story that unfolds in the book has more recently been accepted as, as yeah. em- empirically existent. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, animal behavior in the broad sense, like even broader than per- animal personality has been, is starting to, or has come to the forefront in the last hundred years. Yeah, because, uh, because animal behavior has been studied. And it's, it's funny to think that you, could, you would be studying animal behavior and at the same time absolutely ignoring the yeah. possibility of emotion and personality right. in order to maintain objectivity. Yeah, it's quite silly. But so... Now we have some really... But I, I will say, yeah. yes, it's, it seems very silly in hindsight, but also very understandable from the perspective oh, yeah. of biologists wanting to be, pra- be in a legitimate field of study. Cur- yeah, and, and incremental... Seeing objectivity is the only way to do that. is so critical. We can't rush these things. And this is, how, this is part of the process of science, which is different than the process of naturalists. So as naturalists, we have more leeway, I think, to explore these topics and probably you know all these you know the forefront at the forefront of all these discoveries quote unquote discoveries are naturalists i almost guarantee you that so people who are scientists who are observers of nature who see these things and then want to understand them scientifically so with that being said there are a lot of great studies that are sharp well we've sh- there's definitely been genetic studies showing that personality is real from a nature versus nurture sense in other words our genes animals genes dictate the way they behave in very specific individualistic ways that create personality regardless of environment so the question then becomes why has this happened why is there personality what why wouldn't everybody just have the same personality just like we kind of look the same or like you know most gray squirrels look the same why do gray squirrel why would gray squirrels act differently if they kind of look the same and have the same morphology and i'm going to bring up one study there's a bunch of this kind of stuff but i'm going to i'm just going to describe how this works in the in the world based on this one study and so basically in europe they were looking at great tits which is like a chickadee over there it's a really cool bird very common covers the continent pretty much and there's a lot of different studies so not one singular study but they had shown that these birds had distinct personalities just like i was talking about so the genetics dictate the personality and again so personality is complex and there's a lot of different axes of personality so in other words there's not usually just type a and type b that's way too simplistic so it's usually there's axes of different traits so you might be more aggressive you might be more passive you might be more curious you might be less curious you might be i don't know all these kind of axes but in this particular study they studied aggression versus passivity okay so what the studies were showing with these great tits was that aggressive birds birds that were on the aggressive side of the spectrum were doing much better as far as foraging and reproductive success, when there was much less food. And then in other years, when the trees were masting, in other words, like creating tons more food, more passive birds were doing better. So not only they were getting more food, and they were reproducing at higher rates. Okay, wait, so let me get this straight. So mast year, lots of food, pass the more meek birds, is that fair to say? Yep, sure. The birds on the meek end of the spectrum do really well. And the more aggressive birds do not as well? Yep, correct. And then a lean year where there is not a ton of food, food is scarce, 
the birds on the aggressive end of the personality spectrum do really well. Exactly. And the meek end of the spectrum, the birds on the meek end of the spectrum do not so well. Right. And both of those things, both those environmental changes cause differences in reproductive rates in the population. But they, but it's caused in a way that you have this polarization of these personalities where one type does well in one way, one situation, and one type does well in another situation. And it creates a maintenance in the population of both those types, but it also makes them distinct. So that's how you get personality. Sort of it's an example of how it becomes out, becomes out of natural selection and becomes a viable actual thing that helps species survive over the long term. It's with environmental the, change. Yeah, with it, <clears throat> and I think the the important point here is that it's these are individuals within one population of animals. So they're not. It's not that aggressive birds an aggressive species of bird does well in a lean year. It's that within a single population, different different years result in different personalities within that spectrum. Exactly creating success and resilience within the yeah. population as a whole so that you can weather the fluctuations in yeah. environmental conditions. And it's just another, just to take a pause, another example of how profound Darwin and Wallace's theory on natural selection is and how it explains things so well and articulately and so elegantly, like on this level that's really specific down to personalities. Because he was describing species-level natural selection. And then as hundreds of years have gone by, that theory has trickled down into populations, groups, and now down to the individual level, it explains how personalities evolve. And going back to what we were just talking about, his theory involved no math. (laughs) (laughs) It's just observational. So just that's my Darwin Wallace love. (laughs) So those who embrace the untidy discover new things. (laughs) (laughs) So really the, the moral of the story is with this personality stuff, or with the with the studies of personality is that the diversity of personalities creates resilience within the population because as the environment changes different personality ch- types do better in different situations so if your population has a diverse group of personalities then you're more likely to survive as a population as a species you know when certain things happen so that's the quick and dirty on that you know, we're going to dive into now, like, how does it apply? How do we, because that's what this podcast is about. This po- this podcast isn't about telling you things like. Yeah. If you're interested, if you want like to know even more about that, just go ahead and read the book. Yes. Check out Mousy Cats and Sheepish Coyotes. It's a great book. It's pretty short, pretty easy to read. And it's got a great bibliography, which will send you to all kinds of papers and stuff that will, you know be more specific on this kind of stuff. So if you want the information side of things, that that's definitely check out the book, read it. You you pro- if you're interested in this bit of conversation we've had so far, you'll probably enjoy the book. It's much more thorough than these past 10 minutes have been and <laughs> yes, um, and it'll gi- it'll give you a really clear picture of what we're talking about. But for us, we're talking about how to make how how do people become better naturalists? How do we use this yeah. to make ourselves better at the stuff we love to do? Exactly. And like so this, so all these studies or like this understanding that personality is real can really ch- be a game changer for you out in the field, you know, observing animals and trying to understand what's going on. You know, you might have a bird feeder and you might have, there might be particular birds that you're really keeping an eye on and over a long, long haul, you're getting to know those birds quite well. And if you didn't have the tool of understanding animal personalities at all, you're missing out on a whole lot. So that's what we kind of want to dive into. And I think what we wanted to go into first is these pitfalls of personality because we want it, and we, we've got a bunch of hazards, I guess, for, for, for studying this stuff. And I think we want to temper our study of this stuff. We don't, I think Stefan and I both want to make sure that we're not just arm waving all the time about like what we feel like animals are experiencing or how they are without really the data but also like just some common sense i think common sense is what i is the one thing i would put in right and and again it's as naturalists it's okay for us to make 
a judgment that turns out to be wrong. You know, we're not. Yeah. It's it, it, we can. It, we, it's kind of like we're free to take some risks, and I think you're right. you're going to risk something. You know, by putting yourself into this place of of you know thinking of things in terms of animal like, personality. Like, I feel like this fox is always so timid. And, like, it really, it's different than other foxes that I've known, like, and its tracks are always, like, in these different gates that are going slow, and I don't know why, and I can't explain it in any other way other than it must be just a timid fox. And that's totally valid. I think that it's, like, those kind of stories, those kind of understandings are are more than valid. But I think we just want to be careful as we tread on that. And we're not just, you just, you don't just see one set of fox tracks from a fox that you've never seen before. And you're like, oh, this is a timid fox. I just feel like that's not really mm-hmm. that useful and can, can lead you you and other people you're around astray. But the other side of that is you get to know your fox, the fox that you interact with or or whose sign and trails and, and you know, tracks you interact with. You get to know that. You, you might get to know things about that individual that won't necessarily apply to all foxes which is a great thing yeah, is exactly. a great thing to know because if you're collecting data from one one source you can't necess- you know because yeah. because animals have different personalities you can't necessarily apply that yeah uh, it's not a, and, like a panacea and this gets to our to, to the the biggest hazard maybe of all which is you need more data need more data is always <laughs> what we joke about but it comes up a lot on our podcast like with just studying pretty much anything is making sure that you have enough information to work with do you have enough experience tracking foxes do you have enough experience with this fox those are really important questions and there is going to be a point where you do have enough or like you feel like you have enough and that's going to be up to you we there's no point where we're going to be like yes you have enough information now you know how to <laughs> like that's going to be you're going to have to feel that out but just know that that's a thing that you're going to need to you're going to need to get that dirt time and that experience and get get on those fox trails Another thing is, not all species are going to display personalities. I think birds, a lot of birds are great for taking a look at this, and mammals. And this isn't to say that insects and other groups, mollusks, <laughs> don't have personalities, because they might, very well might. But I, I, it's, it's less likely to me, and also like harder, harder for us to judge. Mm-hmm. Harder for us to say. Yeah, so, so not all species are going to display personality and then i would say even within a species not all individuals are going to display personality in the same ways yeah which is another important point i think yeah. when when you when you're taking this with you out into the field where you're making your observations you you can't expect every fox yeah to display personality in the same way Exactly, because they have personality. Exactly. <laughs> like it's it sounds like it sounds sort of like why like yeah of course it's a no brainer why why are you even bother talking about this but but it's it's important you have to th- keep that perspective yeah in order to there's a spectrum of yeah these make personalities make judgments that I, I are think worthwhile. one thing that Stefan said before we recorded was something about think about how long it takes to get to know someone a human mm-hmm. <laughs> in your life get to know their personality it takes a long time. To make, and and it, and when you make snap judgments about people and their personalities, that's when you go wrong, right? Like that's when you might make a, a mistake that that in a judgment or an understanding of somebody mm-hmm. that that could have costs. So really consider that. Consider how long it takes to get to know somebody, and then and there that's the, that's an individual of your same species. Yeah, we're exactly. talking about. Okay, so this is you have you have as much in common with this with this individual as as you can with another animal. Yeah. And uh at least from like a from like a physical standpoint. Yeah. You're exactly. as much alike as as two individual beings can be and you're still so different. <laughs> and it and yeah, so th- th- just it's it's even furthermore with with animals. So we got so why is it worth it to understand this stuff stuff and like okay, it we we're, we're saying we're we're going into how hard it is to understand this mm-hmm. stuff. Why why should I why shouldn't I just say you know what, like, that's for people who are better naturalists than me, that have more dirt time, that have something that I don't have. Okay, that's, I think that's sort of, uh, 
I don't know. That's a disappointing reaction. I think <laughs> I, I would say, but I, also I think that we're we're ch- where we have you know naturalistics. We're, we have this. We have the triforce and and our the pillars of what we define as being being a naturalist include curiosity. Mm-hmm. And yeah. I think that there are some qu- there are so many questions, not just some questions. There are tons of questions that either cannot be answered at all or 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 can be the answer can be greatly enhanced by reflecting on the context of personality within the animals that you're observing i th- i think there's just so much to be gained in in terms of understanding it's like a it's like the the risk to re- reward ratio to me i feel like the 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 ri- when you keep in mind the pitfalls which we're trying to touch on here and outline mm-hmm. If you if you're aware of those and you keep them at arm's length right. as much as possible, I think that risk gives you s- s- a huge reward in terms of your understanding. Right. In many cases. I mean, some of the coolest stories that you'll hear from naturalists are about this kind of topic. You know, with wolf researchers who spent like two years with one pack and they get to know all the individuals of the pack and all their personalities. And you hear these stories about like, you know, certain wolves acting in certain very unique ways that are almost human-like, maybe even, like caring or like maybe it's aggression or something, some of these extreme behaviors. And the, the stories that you hear from researchers and, and naturalists about that kind of stuff are some of the best stories, most interesting, most headline, headline grabbing of all of all the naturalist stories. I think, it, yeah, I, I, I think if you are serious about studying natural history about observing nature and trying to learn more about it and and answer you know asking questions answering questions telling stories i th- i think that you here i'll put it this way when you go out into the field to make observations the sort of common sense commonly accepted sort of naturalist training regime would have you use all of your senses yep. to the fullest. So they, you, you want to be making observations with your eyes, with your ears. You know, smell is super important. Mm-hmm. Taste sometimes <laughs> and touch Thumbs certainly. All, all those things. And I, to me, I think that being able to understand what an animal might be feeling is like a another, another sense is like another sense. Yeah, and that's that we're going to get into If this. you ignore that, if you yeah. choose to ignore that, it's I li- would liken it to choosing to ignore your sense of sight or your yeah. sense of hearing. I so, think it's pretty valid. Do you want to do you want to go out with with a sense down to make observations? I just don't I feel like you got to use everything you've got. Yeah, and I think we're going to get into that in just a second, the anthropomorphizing thing, using your own emotion like your own feeling about things and projecting a little bit onto animals to understand them better as a tool but before before we move on to that oh i'm jumping ahead no no no, you're not i just want (laughs) i wanted to go back a little bit (laughs) that's your rewind sound effect all right (laughs) Um, (laughs) that was worse (laughs) but i i just wanted to make one point about the personality axes thing I was talking about. And that is that, you know, all these personality traits, they're not, it's not as black and white. It's not as simplistic as like you're either type A or type B. You need to make sure that you're thinking about these things in terms of a gradient along one axis of personality trait. I just wanted to mention that. I want people to think about these things in a more granular way and less in a a type A, type B kind of way. Mm Mm-hmm. And again, this gets into the anthropom- yeah, anthropomorphizing, yeah. which we which we we often do. Naturalists do it, and everybody does it. Yeah, and and it can it can be really helpful. And I think in in particular with you know understanding the that you know, the the gradient axis idea that you're uh, outlining here. Yeah, um, it's just like people can be can do things that you know you you. They might be aggressive in certain situations and and other situations because of some other person you know personality axis yeah. or somewhere where they land on that causes them to behave you know you can be you can be aggressive and sensitive yeah 
Yeah. Or you can be meek and extremely insensitive. Like it's yeah, it's it's right. totally possible that yeah. th- that those combinations can exist. So down to anthropomorphizing. This is the tool, like the the tool to understand personality as a naturalist. Yes, we can tinker with some sort of with some other ways maybe like with your bird feeder your bird feeder might be a tool to understand animal personality. Your tracking might be a tool to understand personality. But what at the end of the day, you're going to be observing these animals' behaviors, and then you're going to be making judgments about what where they fall on those granular axes mm-hmm. that we're talking about. So the granular axes. <laughs> yeah. So you're saying to in order to kind of make the jump from just from like strict behavioral yeah. observation to ex- extrapolating personality, you know, the the underlying personality that might dictate those behaviors yeah and so seth and i talked about this a bunch because we were like well what is anthropomorphizing and we were thinking that basically what it is is anthropomorphizing is relating with your own experience and projecting that onto somebody else or or a non non non-human thing Mm -hmm. right so if i've experienced anger in some situation in my life then and I see an animal in a situation that if I was in that situation, I would be angry. Mm-hmm. I can anthropomorphize and say that animal is angry. Hi, this is highly subjective and, again, historically very big taboo. Like, anthropomorphizing is, is like, <laughs> do not do this Historic, yeah, and, historically in, in animal you know, behavior not, studies. But we, we, on the podcast, we want to talk about this stuff because this is the real deal tools that people use, whether or not they are willing to talk about it openly, people do this all the time to understand things better. And they, and the the thing is that people use it in incorrect ways and they use it in correct ways. Mm -hmm. And also, like you were saying, there's some people who choose not to use it because their fear of being incorrect. Yeah. And we want to encourage people to use anthropomorphizing in a correct way and also know when it's incorrect, Mm -hmm. but not be afraid to use it. Use the force. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it's relating with your own experience. And we broke it down into two, two kind of categories. There are needs and there are wants. So, when we look at animals and we see them in situations, we, we, wanna, we, we can say, why, why is this animal doing what it's doing? All right? And... We can put ourselves into that situation. So some of the first things that you're going to look at are, are the most basic needs that you, that you think that, you, that maybe you have that you think they, they might have. Yeah, and that's why, and it's, this is more powerful than the wants because if you, need, if you need food because you're hungry and you can experience hunger, you know what hunger feels like. That animal might be hungry. I can project and be like, it's hungry, therefore it's looking for food in this area that maybe it wouldn't be. So we saw a duck <laughs> in the road last week. It was super <laughs> weird. It was just kind of random. But it's an interesting situation because it's like, well, why is it here is the automatic question. Yeah. And we can use anthropomorphizing to be like, okay, well, why would it be here? What would it want? Yeah. What would, or what does it need yeah, that's wh- here? What's bringing it here? The needs are that we that we think are basic are food, water, shelter, safety, and maybe sex. Sometimes that's a need out there in the woods. It can be a very powerful motivator. And so, with the duck, it's like, is it here for safety? Like, if I was in this duck situation, yeah. would I be searching for safety in the road? No. Is it searching for shelter? Like, to be, like, away from the elements? Certainly not. It was a raw no. day. <laughs> is it searching for water? Well, probably not, because there's no water there. <laughs> yeah. So... That sort of gets you to food. Like, it's looking maybe for some kind of food, right? Yeah. Not not for sure, but you've already narrowed down. You've already eliminated a bunch of possibilities. And it's all from the question of, like, if I was that duck, why would I be there? Yeah. So, you're anthropomorphizing. <laughs> yeah. So, it's just putting yourself into the situation being like, well, if I was that duck, that's why I would... That would be the most likely reason why I would waddle up to the top of the road and be there. Yeah. And so that that's where the power of the tool is, is in that kind of like, if I was that animal, what would I do? 
and then and, and then we have wands. Okay, and so these are this is the area where I would say that most people are getting it wrong if they're anthropomorphizing in this way. So this is the most treacherous terrain mm-hmm. to to tr- to tread upon, and that's basically our wants are in our in the realm of emotion, in community, loneliness, anger, fear, all those things. So we can see a bird is hiding in the shrubs because it fears something it's afraid well it's actually more helpful to to go back to the needs category and yeah. say what's in the bush is there food seeking, in there <laughs> it's seeking safety maybe mhm okay because if i can say if i if i'm if i'm anthropomorphizing i'm saying this animal is afraid how do i know that hmm how do I know that I can I can know that the animal is is seeking safety or food? Yeah, it's easier to it's easier to be confident in that conclusion. I don't want to dwell on this too much longer, but I think that we really want to be careful about that those kind of emotional realms. It's still important to consider them, but you could again, it's like you whenever you're coming away with a conclusion when you have been in in the treacherous territory that matt's yeah. talking about um you want to remember you remember it in that context yeah um so it's like yeah i've i couldn't figure out any sort of need that would result in that individual being in that situation or right. behaving that way in that situation and so i you know i started to consider these other things these wants and i you know i thought maybe it was out of fear and so that's like okay so you're not saying for like yeah it was afraid yeah. Like anybody can see it's well, afraid. And and I've seen like so I brought up that example because I've seen like sparrows for instance that are like all day being attacked by sharpies, sharp-shinned hawks or something like that. And then they're like literally in the shrubs like not moving for like long periods of time. And I could consider that fear. You know, it's not leaving its area because it just wants to be it just like literally is afraid to go out. Mm-hmm. And that's fine. I think that's okay. The thing that happens is people will see birds in a bird bath or something and be like, oh, they're so happy in there. They're happy little birds. And that's fine. That's fine too. It's just incorrect because it has not, it doesn't really have a basis in what's real and in, in observable. It, the anthropomorphizing goes too far, I feel mm-hmm. like. So, especially if you haven't considered. Oh, they need to be clean. Yeah. <laughs> like they need to they're they're outside all the time doing doing what they do and they get dirty and some and they need to be clean. Just like yeah. we get sick if we don't clean ourselves. Yeah. And so I feel like that's more in the need category, right? Clean clean li- like clean health is so, a, is a need. What we're trying to do is like draw a a thin line but not make it like never cross this line. It's kind of a squiggly line. Because I really don't want people to be just unemotional robots when they're naturalizing. Mm-hmm. I, d- I don't want to see the naturalist community just be, have science envy mm-hmm. and just be always trying to be objective and never thinking, oh, that animal, it might be afraid. It might be doing something irrational because it's afraid. Mm-hmm. I think that can be a valid statement or understanding in some situations. It's just, I really want to caution that that's, that that's really rare, that that might have come up, at least in my experience. So, so that's anthropomorphizing. Powerful tool, but can, be, can get a little funny sometimes. But I just wanted to ch- touch a base on a couple of the hazards of anthropomorphizing. One of them is, I'm calling it the human baby bias. <laughs> Animals are cute. <laughs> So the cuter something <laughs> is, the more, the bigger the eyes are, the more it looks like a human, basically. If it has hands. Flat faces, like, <laughs> then the more likely we are to, to anthropomorphize, and I think the more likely we are, we are to fall in the, to those hazards and traps, mm-hmm. which is interesting because I'm also going to say that the more human-like it is... Morphologically human. Morphologically yeah. and from a phylogenetic sense, mammals... The more likely it is to have personality and the more likely it is to exhibit something that we can actually... Yeah, the, the uh, more likely you are, your needs and wants are going to overlap with that. 
yeah. with a species, so an individual. I guess what it is is that species. when something's cute and fuzzy, we just got to be careful that we're like treating it differently than we would something that isn't cute and fuzzy. <laughs> Guinea pigs are cute and fuzzy. Guinea pigs. The other bias I wanted to mention was superiority bias. Mm. So I think that this one's interesting because it, it, we can feel like we're naturalists, we're humans, we're just doing our thing, but we're better than everything else. And that, and therefore, we can have some pretty skewed understandings of things because we're like, oh, that animal's not smart enough to like understand what's going on right now, mm-hmm. or like that animal can't feel X experience that I feel because it's not a human. Mm-hmm. So I think there's like superiority bias can kind of go both ways a little bit. Um, and then the last one I had was sensory bias, which is kind of like just remind, remembering that. We have a sensory base that's pretty minimal compared to a lot of animals. Mm -hmm. And our eyes are probably our most dominant sense. But for a lot of animals, their sense of smell might be the most dominant sense or hearing or touch. And it's something really important to consider when when you are watching, observing, tracking, following animals. It's like, well, what if I want to anthropomorphize and put myself into this animal's position... I also have to consider what its experience, what's different about its experience based on just its senses. Mm-hmm. Nothing to do with its emotions or needs or wants or anything like that, but just mm-hmm. what does this animal experience just on a sensory level? Yeah. And that can be kind of game changing in terms of, you know, how you might approach a situation or understand, like an understanding. Yeah. I so, mean, looking, going down here to the coast in the winter and seeing all the ducks you know, splashing around in the surf on a freaking cold day. Yeah. Um, you know, you're looking at that and, and, you know, putting yourself in that place and being like, holy smokes, like this is, that looks miserable. But you have to, then you, you think about, okay, well, you know, what do I know about this animal? They don't get wet. Yeah, they don't, they have little They're not wet. On and the water's warmer suits. than the air right now. Mm-hmm. So if you're in the water, not getting wet, you're probably doing okay. Right. And so, yeah, yeah that, totally. That, like, that's one of yeah. those things where it's like that, a duck. You're, when you're a duck, you're actually you have a very yeah. different experience of those things. And it can happen when well, that can happen a lot when you're cold, <laughs> and you see <laughs> other animals, and you're like, they must be cold, right? So I guess that yeah, I think that's imp- really important. The sensory bias. All right, All right so, so I'm about, about I'm about, about done. done. It was a good, podcast. good podcast. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. So, so as, as always, if you uh, have, have a com- you know, leave us a comment. Send us a message if you have any questions. We'd love to, uh, you know, consider, you know, yeah. discuss, discussing listener questions on our podcast. Yeah, um, check us out on. We're on a bunch of social media: Instagram, Twitter. You can email us at naturalisticspod at gmail dot com, and uh, our website is www.naturalisticspod.com. dot com. Thanks for listening. We might be posting some stuff on there, but yeah, thanks for listening. <laughs> Till next time.